Hi, I'm Jake Kuhn, CEO of Risk-Based Security. Welcome to this edition of The Right Security, the show which we spend time talking with leaders and veterans in the security space, tackling the issues of the day. I want to welcome everyone to the show. Today's episode, I am joined by Vince Arnesia. Vince is currently the Chief Product Officer at Gramatech. He's got over 20 years of cybersecurity experience, focusing on uh, product management uh, and product strategy with an executive focus. Prior to his role, he was Chief Product uh, Officer for a company called Five9. He was in charge for product for several other companies, which I have to admit I can't pronounce, so I will not mention them. But to point out, most of them <laughs> did then seem to get acquired by companies that I could pronounce. So maybe there's some learnings there for us that we should discuss at some point. Vince, he likes to live at sort of this intersection of technology, product, and business. Excited to have you here, Vince. Welcome to the show. Great, great. It's great to be here, Jake. Thank you. And uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Perfect. So today, we're going to spend some more time and uh, around software supply chain security and like to get your perspective and your thoughts on, on the whole situation. So su supply chain security continues to be a very hot topic. We've actually talked about it a bit in some of the previous episodes. For anyone that's brand new checking in, uh, there's some other introductory learning information on, you know, look in the channel, you'll see some other things. But since I got, you know, uh, my first question for you is really about resilience. Can you share some of your thoughts on how supply chain security can actually help, like, improve broader IT resilience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, supply chain security is a relatively new sort of phrase or category uh, in the way that it's being coined. Um, but, you know, parts of what supply chain security is now being touted as, you know, has been done for a while from an IT resilience perspective, whether it's, uh, you know, desktop applications or server applications. Uh, but software supply chain security in general, um, it's just taking off. I mean, uh, to the extent that anybody's uh, tracking that, um, you know, there's a ton of funding that's going into net new companies that are positioning themselves as a, as a solution for parts of software supply chain security. Uh, there's new offerings by existing vendors, uh, you know, including Gramatech uh, that are focusing on software supply chain security. Uh, and obviously a lot of that just stems from what's occurred over the last couple of years, um, you know, within uh, the IT landscape. Uh, SolarWinds, you know, being the prime example of a uh, attack that was huge in impact, uh, not just huge, huge in headlines, but huge in, in financial impact uh, to the, the, the hundreds of uh, government agencies, corporations that were directly impacted due to the SolarWinds hack. It all came down to uh, software supply chain security. So, what do you do to further make your infrastructure, your SDLC more resilient to what could possibly occur? And in the case of SolarWinds did occur uh, to your software supply chain. Uh, and so there's, uh, you know, solutions that are popping up that are um, uh, taking the application security testing category to sort of the next level uh, in, in encompassing supply chain security elements to that. Um, there's now specific solutions that are being created to um, dissect and analyze third party applications that are being brought into your infrastructure. So the days of trusting the vendors, um, you know, are really gone. Uh, I mean, they haven't been implemented yet in a lot of organization, but the CISOs and, and the parties that be that make a lot of decisions have agreed to the fact that the zero trust mindset that, you know, is obviously being touted across uh, uh, networks, clouds, um, endpoint has to be carried over to applications. And subsequently, uh, you have to have a zero trust model uh, as it applies to your vendors, to your suppliers, and you need to build in, um, you know, more and more resilience across uh, that side of the spectrum, you know, as well as, uh, you know, what's being done, you know, on the other facets of, of your, um, uh, you know, security life cycle. Software bill of materials, SBOM, we're hearing that all the time. It's been, a, you know, another hot topic. And it, and it definitely yeah. comes up a lot as it relates to the supply chain security 
conversation. So I got I got two questions for you. Um, so let's yeah. let's uh, let I, I'll give you both of them. How about that? I'll give you both of them. Take your time on reply. But so how do you view an S bomb? And then now that we're about ready to start, you know, look, we're coming to the end of the year where every cybersecurity professional wants to predict everything that's going on. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Right. How do you view cybersecurity and what's your prediction around the usage of SBOM? Maybe this coming year and then the years to come. Well, I'll try to remember both your questions because I am old and it's hard to remember things. <laughs> but uh, let's take the first one. Um, so an SBOM, right? What what the heck is an S bomb? And and really, who had heard of that prior to April of this year when the executive order came out from the president, you know, and highlighted the necessity of zero trust, highlighted the necessity of uh, of S bombs and various other things. And so, just you know, at, at its simplistic form, think of a software bill of materials um, as an ingredients list. So as you go grocery shopping and you look at uh, uh, products that you're buying, uh, you know, for off your grocery list, um, sometimes uh, you're looking at the ingredients list on the back of a can, on the back of a package, uh, and it tells you precisely uh, what is in that grocery, right? That 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 product that you're buying, and and then you make a determination that is that product. Uh, that grocery item safe for me to consume, safe for my family to consume? You know, does it have too much sodium? Does it have too many uh, of, of ingredients that would be bad for my health, uh, et cetera, et cetera? So the software bill of materials is effectively the same thing. Uh, whether you're building software or whether you're consuming software, each of these software packages in the future will necessitate you deliver a software bill of materials. So effectively an ingredients list. What commercial uh, source uh, components are you bringing in? What open source components are, are, are part of this particular product? What libraries have you linked in? Uh, all of those different facets of code that comprise of the end application, once again, whether you're building it um, or whether you're consuming something, um, I believe that the, the software bill of material will become effectively sort of a, a file that's delivered um, as part of each and every offering uh, that you digest. And so it'll be part of your software acquisition process in the case of consumption. It'll be part of your release cycle as, uh, uh, you know, if you're delivering software to consumers or, or to businesses, of course. Uh, for you to create a software bill of material, uh, which uh, will tell the recipient uh, what is actually in this. Uh, and then they will make a determination based on what's in this if they have concerns. If you're linking in uh, a open source library that has a ton of CVEs associated to it, um, that could alarm a security engineer who maybe assesses the software bill of materials you know, that's associated to a software package that they're thinking about deploying to hundreds of thousands of workstations, for example. And so that back and forth would occur to where either it would make more sense as to, you know, what the, the component that's being highlighted as a concern, or it would, uh, you know, lead to some other sort of remedy uh, with the vendor that you're dealing with. But uh, to go with your predictions question, which I believe was your second question, um, I truly believe um, that it's about time that this occurred, right? Um, I'm a vendor. I work for a vendor. Um, I've worked for vendors literally my whole career. Uh, that's the path I chose. Um, and it's, it's been absolutely necessary all along. Uh, the blind trust that we put into vendors um, is, is just inherently wrong, especially in today's a crazy, crazy cyber uh, landscape, right? Uh, and we saw that with SolarWinds, uh, just as the uh, ubiquity of that um, uh, exploit and the, the and the millions and hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, billions of dollars that that ended up costing uh, uh, the American people, much less uh, you know the government, much less other entities across uh, in other parts of the world. So. Um, I think the notion of a software bill of material uh, will, you know, as, as, as stated in the executive order, 
will become mandatory, you know, for federal government, federal agencies, uh, critical infrastructure. It's already uh, a very important topic for medical device companies to produce uh, some semblance of a software bill of material, whether it's human readable, uh, machine readable, into one of the formats that's supported uh, for the FDA. Uh, and I think eventually that'll start to percolate into other industries, you know, financial services, for example. Um, and it'll just become, you know, one of the things that's checked uh, when you deliver or consume software. And, and honestly, you know, not just because we're in that space, I just think it's uh, long overdue uh, for vendors to be held accountable uh, for what they're literally throwing into their software um, because uh, it, it could really end up damaging uh, companies if they don't uh, go this route. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you that the, the concept of uh, you know software liability is probably overdue, um, and it's going to be very interesting to see how that that how that happens in the in the real implementation of it with vendors that are pushing back on SBOM, so many different formats, all those sorts of things. All right, so I want to roll into our next one. Keep us moving. When someone says software sure. assurance, what does that actually mean to you? How would you describe software assurance to our uh, viewers? Yeah, it's interesting because we, I mean, I've actually worked in companies that have served um, uh, business units that do software assurance for a living. Um, and, and really what that is, in, in the, there's multiple contexts here, but in the government context, this is a group of, of individuals, uh, basically a team that are that that live day to day to validate the software that once again is either being produced or being consumed uh, into that agency. Um, so there's a you know there's a you know, variety of uh, government uh, defense uh, command centers that have employed you know, a group of folks that um, do software assurance. They assess the software. They ensure that the software um, is, a, 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 is, 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 you know, has limited amount of weaknesses or vulnerabilities. So what they effectively do, and just to get a little sort of technical here, is they'll run a ton of application security testing tools against a variety of software packages. And so if they have a COTS product that's being brought in, or a GOTS product in the case of government, they will run static analysis, they'll run dynamic analysis, they'll run fuzzing tools, they'll run software composition analysis, they'll do binary analysis of different types. They'll throw all of those tools that are in their toolbox, and trust me, those kinds of divisions are, are very well funded, uh, to make sure that the software is, uh, falls into the spectrum of low risk. If it's a high risk application for a variety of reasons, right? It could be uh, the open source components that are in there. It could be the number of CVEs that are in there. It could be the CWEs that are in there. Um, all of those different factors uh, eventually lead to sort of a security score that's being produced to say, uh, we tried to assess the software as part of the software assurance group, and we're deeming this application you know, to be uh, whatever the security score might be. And so that's, that's key for government. Now, similarly, uh, we see this with a lot of uh, embedded customers that are in the, you know, the medical device space or the automotive space or the aerospace and defense space. Um, those folks are really focused around uh, what's referred to as sort of product assurance. They're in the business of creating product. They're in the business of, you know, safety for their patients in the case of medical devices. And so most of those folks uh, that are in that business uh, have to adhere to uh, the product assurance group, which is part of the product security, or chief product security officer, you know, type of uh, uh, a group that it resides within those types of companies and those industries. And, and their job is very similar. They're throwing a ton of, uh, tools, uh, application software centric tools that are analyzing the code to ensure that uh, nothing can go wrong uh, with the software 
which is eventually going to end up in a you know, medical device of some sort. And it's going to literally affect the lives of humans. And so uh, product assurance is conceptually a very similar type of uh, set of individuals. They use a very similar set of tools. You know, they have the same sort of security uh, pen testing type of background. Um, and it's critical. That function of security assurance, software assurance, product assurance, you know, conceptually very similar um, it is absolutely critical uh, for all these different verticals. You know, aerospace, obviously, we're flying. Automotive, obviously, we're driving in cars and, and trusting the software that's all over a car these days. And so somebody has to be um, ensuring that that software is, in fact, um, you know, uh, uh, not uh, overwhelmed with uh, vulnerabilities that are known, you know, or weaknesses in the custom code that could lead to a buffer overflow or could lead to, um, uh, you know, other types of, 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 uh, of vulnerabilities. So it's absolutely um, a very well thought through function in all these different groups and, and companies and industries. And it's absolutely one that is uh, uh, heavily, heavily funded. And it's one that's once again, absolutely necessary. And I'm saying that as a, as a consumer of, of, you know, uh, cars and, 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 and airplanes and, and medical devices and those kinds of things that, that, that affect us every day. So uh, appreciate the, the detailed answer. That was, that was awesome. So for someone that's, that's watching us right now and they're trying to put this all together, is, is there a, a quick way to, to sort of try to explain what software assurance is in the context of supply chain security? Is it the same thing? Is it part of it? it you know, a lot of times we're using terms and it's starting to confuse people in industry. So how do you, how do you, how do you quickly say, yeah. this is what software assurance is, this is supply chain? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely going to be more, more overlap as software supply chain starts to become a category and, and actually something that's budgeted um, you know, and accounted for within all these organizations. Um, you know, the notion of software security falls on both sides of the fence, not just the folks that are building the products, uh, you know, the vendors, because they have to be more accountable, uh, but also for the folks, uh, you know, within, you know, the large financial services, maybe as an example, you know, that are consuming the products. Uh, the software assurance teams are typically very deep, uh, very um, knowledgeable, very security minded. Um, you know, very uh, uh, skilled. Uh, I would say software uh, supply chain uh, can be, and, and I think it will be, uh, a lot simpler to, to do and accomplish, you know, through a variety of sort of automated checks that occur, let's say, during the software acquisition process, software procurement process. You know, so, so if I'm a large insurance company and I'm um, uh, bringing in a ton of software, which of course I am, whether it's existing vendor with a new version of software, whether it's a new vendor, um, I want to have some level of automated checking taking place um, that tells me that this software uh, passes the test, it passes the mustard, right? Is it a pass or fail? And so uh, those kinds of, I would say, um, you know, lesser skill set required capabilities or tools are what's really being born right now uh, so that we can do uh, those kinds of checks at a, at a level that is more, you know, at the procurement acquisition uh, sort of level. And so I think the software assurance folks, you know, once again, skilled, deep, tons of uh, complicated tools that they're using uh, to assess that software supply chain is more of a broader category that I think will uh, affect a lot of individuals but ones that necessarily aren't, um, you know, security minded or have that deep technical skill, but they do want to vet um, software that's being brought into their corporation, you know, through some sort of automated tools. And, and that gives them a thumbs up or thumbs down so that they can then, um, you know, pass it on to somebody else. So that's kind of the direction we're, we're seeing, um, you know, those, those, uh, those factions play out. In June of this year, you contributed an article to Forbes, and it was uh, titled How to Address Digital Supply Chain Vulnerabilities. And by the way, we're coming up on 9,000 vulnerabilities with no CVE this year alone. So, Vince, I'm going to get you to stop saying CVE eventually as we 
we continue to talk and work uh, together. But <laughs> you mentioned in this article, and by the way, I'll throw a, a link in the show notes for everyone to go take a good article. But in the article, you mentioned traditionally organizations have taken one of three approaches when it comes to their security posture uh, and the applications they use. The first one you said was hope. The second one you said was trust. And then the third one you said trust but verify. Can you give us just sort of a you know a quick recap of each of those you know areas and, and how you view the hope trust and trust but verify? Yeah. So first of all, it's it's good to see you doing your homework. Uh, so that that's good. Uh, June is a long time away, even though it's only four or five months. But uh, yeah, yeah. So you know, part of what we're trying to do is to educate the market. Right. There's a whole evangelism side to. Um, you know, the work that Gramatech's doing in, in the software supply chain area and that article, you know, plus, you know, many others and webinars, et cetera. I just did a uh, like a what the dev type podcast, which was pretty cool the other day for SD Times. So, you know, really. What have companies done for software that's being brought in? A lot of companies, especially the smaller companies, you know, the midsize companies, they don't have the staff or the skill set. Uh, to vet anything that's really being brought in at, at any kind of cursory level, much less deep level. And so they, they live under the hope cloud, right? They basically trust a vendor and it could be a, a vendor that's very well known, right? Like, like a, a web conferencing tool that you might be using. Uh, or it could be, you know, a, a little utility that one of your developers or a team of developers decides to download that is now in your infrastructure, that is now on your environment. And so there's really no checks and balances there. They kind of trust their people. And that's sort of the hope uh, mindset. And it's hard to overcome that because, once again, they don't have the skills, the budget, the wherewithal to, to do anything about that. Uh, the, the second one is they trust. So they form the relationship with the vendor um, and they maybe do something contractual, you know, that holds the vendor liable if, they, if there's something that does go wrong with uh, a weakness or a vulnerability that exists within the vendor's application. Um, but there's trust there and it's sort of established with the vendor, you know, primarily in sort of a contractual way. The third is sort of the trust, but verify. And, and that really that verification, uh, you know, for the larger companies is, is all manual. Uh, literally, and we've heard this from, you know, large financial services company, you know, Fortune 100 type of companies that they absolutely uh, do not live under the hope cloud. They absolutely uh, work with the vendor to establish trust, contractual sort of legal trust, but they also absolutely verify um, that the application that they're going to be consuming, you know, uh, uh, distributing, et cetera, um, is technically sound, right? And say, but they do that manually and they do that through a team of pen testers that, you know, have very specialized skill or very highly paid, have access to a bunch of utilities, some open source, you know, some of, of their own uh, homemade. And so these guys pound away at the application using a variety of, you know, uh, 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 fuzzing tools and, and, and other pen testing tools. And they sort of vet the, the, the quality of the application uh, for vulnerabilities, for weaknesses. But once again, that's all manual. And in today's day and age, um, that doesn't scale. Because right now, every corporation, whether you're small, medium, or large, you're consuming a ton of software. You're bringing in a ton of software because we're doing everything digitally, including you know something like this. And so that doesn't scale the whole trust, but verify manually model. And so really, um, you know, that article spoke to the next wave of, of process, which is to trust, but verify in an automated, scalable fashion. And that really goes back to those supply chain security technologies and capabilities that are you know, being born that uh, companies, you know, like that insurance company example I was giving you, they will have to implement that uh, because um, you know, it will allow their business to be more successful. It will increase productivity if a pen testing team does not have to spend a month beating the crap out of an application to give it a thumbs up or thumbs down. 
uh, and, and multiply that by hundreds of applications or versions of applications uh, that are being brought in. It's really clear that there's a, a big need for improved vulnerability management, uh, particularly around information, being able to sort of get that visibility from that application layer perspective. Can you share a little bit about what, right. what you guys are seeing? You know, Grammatech, you guys have been around. For those that don't know, Grammatech, I think, was founded in like 1988. You guys have been around the block. This is not your first right. rodeo. So can you share a little bit about what you're seeing, maybe that visibility of vulnerability related data for those third-party libraries and apps yeah absolutely yeah so grammatech has been around a long time uh, we are really uh, tight with the government uh, we work very closely with a variety of government agencies to do bleeding edge innovative research in addition to having uh, a product portfolio that you know does some of the things that we we talked about earlier uh, from a uh, code scanning perspective um, uh, but but yeah, I mean we we uh, uh, we agree with you, right? Uh, vulnerabilities um, are all too common, and you know to your point earlier, um, uh, all the vulnerabilities that people think exist, they think they exist with a CVE, you know. And, and as you guys have shown us over, over the last few years, uh, longer, uh, that's not the case, right? There's thousands, uh, tens of thousands of vulnerabilities that don't have a CV associated to them. And, you know, that sort of gets lost in the noise. Um, but from an application layer perspective, which is, you know, obviously our domain expertise, um, once again, there, there's not a lot of uh, uh, light that's being shed on vulnerabilities that exist in applications. And the data that uh, RBS provides, you know, is immensely valuable in quickly identifying uh, vulnerabilities that exist, you know, not just CVE centric, but uh, more holistic, giving tons of uh, valuable data associated to each of those vulnerabilities, whether they have a CVE or not, you know, giving you things like uh, uh, risk scores, giving you things like remediation information, giving you things like license information, uh, just tremendous data that sits alongside the vulnerability itself. Uh, to make the folks that are uh, uh, leveraging those kinds of techniques and tools uh, more knowledgeable and in a, in a position to actually act on that. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons, um, you know, we're excited to be working with you guys on that front because the application layer uh, from a vulnerability management, you know, vulnerability discovery perspective hasn't really uh, gotten the focus over the years that, that it uh, really should have. Uh, and now with solar winds and you know lots of other noise related to uh, supply chain centric uh, uh, issues, um, you know there's more and more uh, funding, more and more uh, budget that's being put towards application security uh, and, and vulnerability discovery, vulnerability management, you know vulnerability uh, uh, remediation uh, is is a big part of that. Um, yeah, I'm I'm sort of a industry security veteran. Uh, I've been in security uh, for twenty something years. I've been in application security for twelve to thirteen of those years, and uh, it's amazing how far application security has come um, in regards to you know uh, uh, conversation, in regards to budgetary focus. In regards to um, you know funding from uh, you know venture capital and PE firms, in regards to priority um, you know within uh, CISOs uh, and and their priority list, um, and, and it makes a lot of sense, right? Everything we're doing uh, in in our day to day lives is now software driven, right? We're on our phones. That's driving everything we're doing. That's software driven. You know, we're we're changing the temperature in our thermostat at home. You know, that's software driven. We're driving our cars to the grocery store. You know, that's pretty much all software uh, uh, everywhere within the car. Um, you know, we're we're having this type of call. We're doing our day to day work from home or wherever we are. You know, that's all software driven. And so the notion of applications and the need for more and more application security the notion for more and more application centric visibility to vulnerabilities um, is really the next wave of uh, of cyber 
and, and we're seeing that, right? There's a lot of companies that are in the application security testing space that are getting, um, and I'm not exaggerating here, hundreds of millions of dollars. There was a company that a couple of weeks ago, you know, got a $625 million funding round that's in this space. Another one, you know, over half a, half a billion. Uh, and so um, it just speaks to, you know, the world that we're in, the world that's it's going to progress more and more, uh, uh, you know, from a software perspective and, and the vulnerability aspect of it and the visibility to it, the awareness of it, the ability to manage it, remediate it, uh, you know, couldn't be more critical. I think you're, you're spot on. There's obviously a, a huge need here. The market's finally realizing it, uh, as you mentioned. Right. Uh, there, there's been a need and the need continues to grow. So so let's talk a little bit about uh, Gramatech here for a second. In August of this year, you guys, from what I'm aware of, announced the latest version of your uh, SaaS platform, Code Sonar. And in this version, a, a lot of automation where it can detect uh, defects, help accelerate uh, you know, folks that are trying to get into DevSecOps uh, and really looking at embedded, right. you know, development pipeline, all those sorts of things. So, you know, without being a sales weasel, but the product guy, can you tell us a little bit more about the launch? How's <laughs> it going? You know, are, are you seeing that it's really helping to get folks that maybe aren't security experts to start thinking security? Talk to me a little bit here. Yeah, the, the gist of that release, um, and, and even a, a release that was earlier this year, uh, in 2021 this year, um, was really focused around DevSecOps and how do we make the technology um, more applicable, more accessible, um, more seamless for the developer. Um, you know, let's say you're a, a large automotive, you know, manufacturer, right? Uh, you make cars uh, primarily. Uh, you you write a lot of code, right? You might write a lot of custom code. You might depend on tier one, tier two providers to write code for you. You might bring in a bunch of open source code, but your developers are putting all of that together to then deliver the car software experience. And so those developers need to now, and in fact must keep security in mind. In this particular example and scenario that I'm describing, you know they have to adhere to various uh, industry standards like MISRA for for coding standards, et cetera, AutoSAR, a few others. And so, uh, what our technology does in, in the versions, you know, the releases that you're talking about, is it makes that more of a seamless process. So let's say you're sitting in GitLab or you're sitting in GitHub, uh, the ability to be able to uh, you know, look at the results of the findings from the scan for static analysis that took place. Uh, just being able to act on that and maneuver that through, you know, your IDE, through your uh, code repository, um, you know, being able to uh, identify issues, directly log those into JIRA. That whole workflow, that whole sort of continuous integration, continuous deployment type of model, for security to fit into that, that's really uh, this this part of this wave that we're talking about, right? Uh, from a DevSecOps perspective, and so enabling security, you know, application security, you know, security that's you know sort of developer focused, uh, is absolutely um, uh, the next wave, uh, because once again, the ubiquity of software uh, in everything that we do requires that software to be secure. In fact, it, it mandates it in certain industries. Um, and so what we're what we've been really focusing on is um, making the developer's life easier um, uh, from a workflow automation perspective and, and bringing some of what historically has been in our sort of standalone product uh, into interfaces like, you know, GitLab, uh, uh, GitHub uh, and a few others, uh, you know, going into next year. All right. This question is for Vince, the product guy, okay? So how do you view the evolution of product development and features as uh, new needs come out? Is this a good thing having, you know, one single unified tool or is there the risk to like core usage, core clients maybe trying to do too much? You know, with your product manager hat on, how, how do you balance these good but maybe conflicting approaches to, to building a product? 
Um, yeah, I mean, building a product, um, the, the key to building a product is having uh, source, sources of data and assembling those sources of data into you know, sort of a crystallized picture and then deriving insights from that. Um, so what, what I really mean by that is, you know, you, you can be talking to um, analysts, you can be talking to the field, you can be talking to sales engineers, you can, of course, be interacting with customers, you know, you can, you, you can get tons of data points uh, for, you know, how your product should evolve from all over. Uh, and it's good. The, all those data points have relevancy. Um, but all those need to be, you know, aggregated into a centralized sort of system. Uh, we use a product management SaaS platform, which takes all of that data in, uh, you know, uh, through some automated fashion, you know, uh, integrations with Zendesk, et cetera. But then also, you know, a lot of manual um, uh, entering of, of, of those kinds of data points. But then you have to distill that and derive insights. So what are all these customers saying about this particular feature, right? Is this, is, are they on the right track? Is this strategically what we want to do? You know, is this where the market is going versus what we think will happen or what one customer, you know, thinks will happen? And so uh, a lot of those insights um, have to be carefully thought through, but you have to have a pulse for, you know, what's happening in your, your, your category or your industry. Um, and, and so in the case of, um, you know, application security testing, you know, that's obviously the area that we focus on. And so, you know, we look at all those different data sources uh, to derive insights to eventually make decisions, you know, on, uh, on what needs to happen, uh, you know, with the direction of the product. Clearly, uh, you know, especially for smaller companies, but really all companies in general, um, a part of your roadmap is driven by um, customers and what they must have. And what sales is telling you the customer must have, whether it's an existing customer, you know, or a prospective customer. Uh, but you have to balance that with, um, you know, items on the roadmap that are strategic, that you've drawn insight from, you know, through those different data sources, uh, you know, to balance that. Some releases, you know, it'll be it'll be 50 50 50 percent tactical sales related you know sort of coin operated and then the other 50 you know strategic some releases you know you might be 80 20 like end of year type releases in order to you know help help bring business in uh that's the delicate balancing act that um uh you know somebody that's leading product has to balance um but at the end of the day um you always want to um, you know, add value to the product uh, across the spectrum. Uh, you never want to just focus on, like, for example, you know, we have uh, a very deep product in, in Code Sonar that you mentioned earlier. And so we never want to just work on, you know, the back end, uh, you know, warning classes or checkers that we create. That's a part of the product. That's an absolutely critical part of the platform because that, that's the kind of stuff that tells you if you have, uh, um, you know, custom code uh, weaknesses uh, in your application. But then, you know, just as you alluded to, right, uh, there's a lot of front end stuff, there's integrations. Uh, these days, nothing is siloed, everything's part of an ecosystem. Uh, and you have to build that way. And so integrations with GitLab, GitHub, Jira, uh, Jenkins, all those are critical, you know, for our product uh, and our category. For companies, that are just struggling with too much cybersecurity work, too, too many applications, too many vulnerabilities, too much data, too many vendors they have to deal with. Vince, what do you say to people that just feel really overwhelmed or they just don't even know where to start? Wow, that's tough because, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the way of the world right now. And uh, uh, you're, you're gonna have to keep up. Uh, so, I mean, outside of that answer, um, I would say you've got to look at managed services. You've got to look at uh, companies that provide the areas where you have gaps, uh, skill set gaps, you know, funding issues, whatever. Uh, you've got to look at, you know, companies that do that for a living um, and, and, and subscribe to their service for, 
um, uh, you know, like an MSP or an MSSP or, or even uh, like you know, uh, managed detection and response type companies. Um, I mean, there's a lot of companies out there that um, are there to serve you and help you. Uh, obviously, the, you know, they're going to they're going to want a pretty penny for providing you that service. But, um, you know, more and more, obviously, you know, with the ubiquity of the cloud now, uh, there's a lot that you can accomplish from a, uh, uh, you know, uh, v- vendor perspective by using these managed services. And so I would say uh, if you're struggling with that, um, you know, start to look at the landscape of companies that can really help you uh, from a managed service perspective uh, and, 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 and sign up with those guys to give it a shot. Uh, those companies have really advanced and evolved over the years. Um, and, and so, you know, they're probably uh, lower priced than you might be thinking. Their, their level of services um, and the, the breadth of services they offer is probably a lot richer than you might be envisioning. Um, and, and, of course, you know, they have to adhere to SLAs, you know, that can work to your advantage. Uh, so I would definitely suggest that if you're struggling, you know, with trying to do everything yourself. Fan, from what I can tell, and a big Washington D.C. sports fan at, at that, which can be really, really tough. We're here in Richmond, Virginia, <laughs> and it's a topic in the office quite a bit about suffering D.C. fans. But you're also a coach, so my question for you, putting you on the spot: Do you have any sports ball wisdom or advice that you can relate to cybersecurity? Maybe people in their careers that you can share with our viewers today. Yeah, it's once again you've done your homework, so that's that's good. Um, well, so the first point about Washington team struggling, right? I think that, you know, was true. I tell my daughter and my son this all the time. You know, the Redskins won uh, three championships, 83, 88, 92. Um, and so we had a big drought. We had a long drought until 2018 when the Caps won. And then 2019 when the, the Nationals won. Uh, so, yeah, I'm a huge D.C. sports fan, uh, have been, uh, grew up here. Um, but as far as coaching goes, um, you know, sports um, is my hobby, uh, whether it's uh, watching it, it used to be playing it, now it's really coaching it. Um, I love developing kids and seeing that, you know, confidence uh, arise in kids when you have success um, in, in, you know, different sports and different parts of the sport and you know, mastering a position or, or a specific skill. Um, but the, the thing that I love most about sports is team, right? It's all about the team. Um, you can have the best hitter, look at Mike Trout in baseball, uh, never made the playoffs, right? Hasn't won a playoff game, never made the playoffs. Uh, arguably the best hitter of the last 10 years, uh, best all-around player, highest war, Never made the playoffs. So it's all about team, and that carries over to um, your company. Um, uh, you know, I run a team of, of uh, 40-something people, and uh, it's all about teamwork. It's all about culture. It's all about collaboration. Um, you know, if one person wins, everybody wins. Um, and, and so we, we preach that, uh, you know, for coaching kids. Uh, for a lot of years, I did that with my son. Now I'm doing that with my daughter. And the same thing applies to uh, your work environment, right? We have folks that are employed at Gramatech that are literally all over the world uh, because that's, you know, how you employ a, a workforce these days. Uh, but, you know, we're collaborating on teams. We're, we're communicating all the time. You know, we're helping each other out. Uh, we're, we're brainstorming on a, a story or a feature or an epic. Um, and, and it works well because everybody feels like they're part of a team and leading to the collective success. And so that's what sports um, has taught me over the years. Um, and I've tried to convey that model and that mindset, uh, you know, to the to the professional environment. Great, great insight there. So we're rounding out the show here. So in your mind. What's the next big thing? What's the what's that thing that's around the corner that you're starting to see, you're starting to work on? Or is there anything else on your mind that you want to share with us as as we close out the show? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a, a little bit of it we discussed earlier, but I'll reiterate it in a, in a 
sort of simpler way. Um, uh, you know, the application is, is really the new perimeter. Um, if you're working on developing code, you're working on an application, um, that has to be the layer that's um, uh, secured the most. Um, and I think the world has evolved to recognize that over the last, I'd say, five years or so. Uh, but I think clearly that will continue to be the case, you know, for the next, uh, you know, who knows how long, uh, definitely until I retire. Um, so, you know, I think the notion of, of, of software, the notion of application, the notion of products um, from a cyber perspective, um, you know, that's that's right up there now uh, as it relates to priorities, um, you know, with budgets and so on and so forth. Clearly, cloud security is right up there. You know, data security is uh, moving up there. Um, and I think, you know, that's what I'm, I'm really excited about. I think, like we talked about earlier, uh, things like the executive order, things like the, you know, software, uh, 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 software supply chain discussions and conversations that are taking place. And you know, big conferences like RSA conference coming up in February of, of next year, um, seeing those kinds of uh, categories and topics become uh, primary conversation uh, is exciting to me just because of the number of years I've spent in uh, application security uh, from a product vantage point. Uh, so so that, that's exciting to me and I think that uh, speaks to the real need um, going forward. Uh, and if you combine that with, you know, other layers of security, you know, that are doing exceptionally well, you know, I think we're doing a really good job of, of securing our infrastructure, uh, of keeping people safe. Um, and, um, you know, the zero trust model uh, as an example. So I think, you know, the paradigm shift that's occurring in cyber is, is really exciting. And, and I'm looking forward to, to sort of continue to be a part of that. Vince Arnesia, Chief Product Officer, Gramatech. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I really appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, it, it was great chatting with you, and uh, we should do it again. This was great, Jake. You should uh, you should take a job at CNN. You do a really good job getting your homework done and, and good questions. I, th I think they have an opening now, so you should take that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Right Security. Uh, as always, we'll have more details and links in the show notes. Um, don't forget to subscribe uh, wherever you get your podcasts, leave a review, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and you can learn more about uh, RBS on our website. Thank you for tuning in. So that's a good one. Yeah.